be with us now as we turn to your word and give us a childlike faith. God, we need to realize who you are and how great you are. Make that real in our hearts and in our minds. Change us from the inside out to be a true people of God. I ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So, last week we finished up, and it was a pretty heavy hitter, um, and I got more feedback on that sermon than I've gotten on any sermon that I've ever had, um, which I was kind of wondering what y'all thought about it, and, and the praise be to God, uh, most of you told me what you thought about it, and it was not what I thought you would think about it. It was very positive. And so I praise God for a people that are willing to hear the truth, understand the truth, and a people that are willing to, to be hit hard between the eyes by the truth of God and the Word of God and, and digest it and then give feedback that is, that is both positive and it is uplifting to the, to the community. So I want to praise you guys for that. That was a beautiful thing. Um, it was one of the most nerve-wracking sermons I've ever given because it had to do with the pocketbook, if you remember correctly, and it was a, it was a pretty serious uh, look at how we use money and what money does for us. This week, take a deep breath, this is beautiful. This story is not my normal need to wear your steel-toed shoes, smash your toes, and hit you in the face with the two-by-four kind of sermon. This is lovely. It really, really is. We're going to go into the story in Matthew. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 19. Um, if you've got your phones, you can also look it up on there. But before we go there, I want to tell you that next Sunday is Palm Sunday, so we're going to be discussing what Palm Sunday is. You know, sometimes we celebrate things in the church, and we don't really talk about what those things are. We talk about Christmas, and we talk about Easter, but why palms? And so, be ready for next week, because I think that you're going to benefit from that, and, and, and learn what the significance is, and what it was actually going on at the beginning of Holy Week. So, be ready for that this coming week, this coming Sunday, but for now... Let's go to chapter 19 in Matthew and look at what happens. And then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. What's beautiful about that story, it's kind of a strange little quiff outside of, you know, the, the normal things that were going on. Jesus is sitting there with his disciples and people are bringing children to him. And this word brought is in the imperfect tense. Those of you that know anything about English, it is continually happening. You ever had an experience in your life where something continually happened and it wasn't something that you were planning on happening? How many of you, without raising your hands, would be particularly irritated by said occurrence? <laughs> you ever had something that happens over and over again to you and, and it irritates you? Huh? Groundhog Day? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most people probably haven't even seen that many. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, here's what you need to know. In the Jewish culture of that day, oh, consequently, I did not write on the slides this week. It's a normal PowerPoint presentation because my iPad died. <laughs> Apparently, I am wonderful at killing expensive electronics. <laughs> Praise be to God, though, Dakota talked me into buying an Apple Care plan, and it got fixed. For free. <laughs> so, if you all need something, go talk to Dakota at the mall. All right. I'm not sponsored by them. That's just that's just a good choice. Anyway, yeah, simply Matt. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, so Jesus is sitting there, and all these people are coming up, and they're bringing their babies. And, and the idea of the children is not big children, but little babies, like helpless little babies, maybe toddlers. But they're bringing them to be blessed by a rabbi. And Jesus, being a teacher, was considered a rabbi. And the people had known what Jesus was doing. They had heard the stories of the amazing things that Jesus was doing, all the miracles, waking the dead and making blind people see and the deaf to hear and and lame people walk. And there's all these crazy, awesome stories about Jesus. And people are bringing their babies to be blessed by Jesus. It was common practice. This was not something that was weird. Um, In some churches, they actually do this. It's called christening or baby dedication or there's a number of different words for it. I don't have a problem with blessing babies. I have a problem with baptizing them. Right? So because I think that you ought to be able to remember the experience. And and, and I'm not saying that it's not baptism. All I'm saying is I'm not going to do it. Right? I'll honor it but I'm going to suggest that you have an experience of baptism after your conversion so that you can experience the wonder that is baptism. Jesus was not baptizing babies. I have heard it said in the scripture that that's exactly what he was doing. That's not true at all. He was doing what normal rabbis do and giving a blessing to the children. Giving, saying, you know, God be with you. You know, that your family may raise you up to know that God is true and and those kind of things. Young children were considered to be assets, basically, at at best. In In the Roman world, if they had a child that they didn't want, guess what they did with that child? They would set it outside in the elements. Dogs would get it or... Birds would peck it to death, or they would throw it into the garbage. This is the culture and time that Jesus is living in. These are the, the, and that was common. I know that to us, that is detestable, but to them, it was completely normal. Now, the thing that you need to know is that Jesus came to change the perception human lives. That was one of the reasons that he came. Because he came as a small child and grew into a man, became a teacher, and blessed the people that were around him. Blessed the children that would come into his presence. This is a beautiful story. How many of you can close your eyes and see Jesus sitting there with a whole bunch of kids crawling around on him? That is a Jesus that I like to imagine in my mind. Yes, Jesus is the lamb. He is the lion. He is the warrior. He is all things. He's also a really good dad. Even though he never had children of his own, he taught us that you need to spend time Blessing children in the presence of children. Those of you that don't like children, you should spend time with them. What you will find is that after a while, you will be blessed by them. Some of the things that come out of their mouths blow my mind. Some of the questions that I get asked from children, it it just, some of them I can't answer. I just stand there with my mouth open. I'm sure they think I'm I'm dumb as a rock, and that's probably true, but they just wow me sometimes with questions. But you need to know that this was happening over and over again, and probably they were trying to do something, right? The disciples were trying to learn. Jesus was probably trying to teach them, and then interrupted by a mom bringing a baby and another mom bringing a baby and all of a sudden there's a tassel of babies and moms standing around and the disciples said listen y'all need to go on we got stuff to do y'all need to head out because you're stopping us from doing ministry and what's really interesting 
is that I'm like that sometimes. I'm like that sometimes. Uh, if I'm trying to do something and you come in and interrupt what I'm trying to do, I can occasionally be rude. I can occasionally be short and sassy. I can occasionally just be not Christian. And what's hilarious or sad, depending on how you look at it, is that I'm usually writing a sermon. Or I'm usually researching some sort of theological something. Because I spend a lot of time doing that. And if you interrupt me, it, it, it irritates me. This is what was happening. And so the disciples, <laughs> assuming that Jesus was also irritated by this, says, hey, listen, you guys need to leave. But they were being what I like to call religious. And this is kind of scary, right? Because we have the tendency to be particularly a religious people. We have the tendency to be stubborn. Don't we? We've done it this way forever. As long as I can remember. I get that answer a lot. It doesn't matter what church I'm in or what group of people I'm in. Why do you do this? Because that's the way we've done it. That's the way we know how to do it. And we don't want to change. They were also religious people tend to be particularly sophisticated, right? They think highly of themselves, don't they? Like, for instance, sometimes when you start talking to me, I have to stop the religious part of me from saying, this person has no idea what they're talking about. Or, I know a whole lot about this. I can help you. Instead, Instead of just listening to you, I'm actively coming up with and, and not paying attention at all to what you're doing. I'm inside my head coming up with some theological answer. I have to stop myself from being religious often because it's a trap for us. They also tend to be supreme, which leads from this sophisticated understanding of I'm better than you at whatever. Right? So... They need to be superior, and so they set themselves higher than you. Jesus set himself on the ground with the little babies. God himself sat down on the ground and played with the babies. Laid his hands on them and blessed the babies. He spent time with the babies. He poured out his life with the children. Nowadays, we spend a lot of time separating everybody. And, and I think that that's very okay as long as we have times to come together so that everybody in the family might get to experience the glory that is the younger generation. Children are pliable. They are. Um, you can teach them, and they like to learn most of the time, at least until they get to a certain age, and then things change. But most of them love to learn, and they get excited when they learn. They want to show you what they've learned, or what they've created, or what they've sang, or whatever it is. They want to show you what they're learning, and, and you can help mold and guide them. That is what God calls us to do. He says, look, older people. Teach the younger people how to be good, godly men and women. <laughs> younger people, pay attention. Be pliable. Be teachable. Right? Don't be a hard lump of clay that nobody can use. You know what happens if you become a hard lump of clay? We throw it in the trash. We get some good soft clay to make a pot. Because you can't make a pot, pot out of a rock. And children are very teachable. They're also, whether they want to be or not, subordinate. They necessarily have to be. 
Because children need help. They can't do it themselves. They need somebody to come along and take care of them. Because two years old and naked is no way to start a life. But if you leave two-year-olds long enough, one of them will be naked. (laughs) Guaranteed. They need guidance. They're also way more excited about things than we are most of the time. You ever notice that? Like just bubbling over excitement about what we would consider nothing. When was the last time you were bubbling over with excitement for anything? Most of us can sit and look at the glory of the mountains or the glory of the beach and be like, ah, that's beautiful. Right? Is that not true? When was the last time you were awed in just complete awe and excited about anything. We have learned that we come and sit in rows quietly and stare at a man with a microphone and a clicker and look at a screen and we make sure that we have zero reaction to anything he says except for the occasional amen or yawn. Right? (laughs) Why? We're here to worship God. That's what we're here trying to do. And I am tasked with giving you the tools to worship God better. Help feeding you a little bit of the milk of the Word. Take it. God is giving it to you. He's offering you sustenance, food to keep you going. And then Jesus says something that's super interesting. We're going to jump back to 18, uh, chapter 18, because Jesus is hearkening back to something that he told them just one chapter before. And, and I'm not going to read this whole section to you. But I want, you to, I want you to look at a couple of parts of it. Um, they, they are having children come to them. and But Jesus, Jesus and the disciples are, are, are walking down the road, hanging out. And the disciples are arguing about, now listen to this, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Right? Who is the greatest in the kingdom? In the kingdom. This is what they're arguing about. And Jesus says, I say to you, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he just told them this, and just one chapter later, the kids are coming to him and they're like, take the kids away. They're bothering us. And Jesus says, No, let the children come to me. And then he blesses them. Do you see how he's switching the idea of importance around. He's flipping their world upside down. We don't think that way because we've been brought up with this upside down idea that the next generation is an important, they're they're the one that's going to run everything, you know, that idea. No, the next generation to, to the ancients were... Nothing until they were viable to have a job and make some money for the family or or create more babies. But they were arguing, who is the greatest? Here's some things that, that I've come to understand from this section of the scripture. First of all, a child in rags is content with love and milk. Think about that. That is is quite the statement, isn't it? It doesn't matter what you wrap your baby in. That's cool. I'm just going to stop touching that. I'm sorry. I may have broke it. Um, Yeah. Love and milk, right? I don't remember what I was saying. Um, Children 
It doesn't matter what you wrap your babies in. You can wrap them in gold leaf blankets and have silver trinkets hanging from them. What they want is love and milk. What they need is love and milk. It's interesting that Jesus uses the Christian life as uh, children and then maturing into adults, as Christians, as spiritual Christians, right? He uses this same kind of idea to show us that we should be growing in our faith. What happens if you feed a baby peanuts? What? Yeah, they're going to choke on it. Yeah. What if you cut a piece of nicely cooked medium rare steak and you stick it in a small child's mouth? You're going to need to know the child Heimlich. That's what's going to happen. Because you're not feeding them what they need at the time. Eventually, they will begin to grow and they will need to eat more than just milk. Eventually, milk will not be able to sustain their growth. If you just kept them on milk, they would not grow correctly. But they have to have milk to begin this process. It's necessary. Most of us understand this, and yet... Most of us don't apply it. Do you desire the milk <coughs> of the Word of God? Do you desire to be fed from that which begins the process of growth spiritually? Do you have a longing to want to read about God, to know more about your Heavenly Father? About his son? Do you want to know and have a drive, a hunger for that truth that helps mature you? Or are you a starving child? In some ways, the disciples were in very close proximity to Jesus. But they sure were anywhere near what he was trying to tell them. They couldn't see what he was saying from where they were, even though they could see him physically right next to him, reach out and touch him. What he was telling them was so far on occasion that they couldn't even see it. And he looks at them and says, well, I just told you this yesterday. What's wrong with you people? I don't want to be like that. I don't like to see myself as that. But if I'm honest with myself, I'm very much like that on many occasions. Close proximity. Sitting at my desk with the Word of God open. Reading and writing the Word of God and trying to come up with something and completely distracted by Everything else that's in my life can't see what the scripture's telling me. Have you ever done that? Those of you that do Bible study, if you don't do Bible study, go ahead and start. Once you start, this will become a problem. Just so you know, that doesn't, problems don't go away. They just change form, right? So now I'm, I'm studying the word and I'm in the word and I've, you know, uh, and I'm thinking about the angels singing because I'm doing this or, or something ridiculous, you know. Or, or, you know, the, the glory of God beginning to show in the room. or I, I mean, my mind is ridiculous, guys. And, and I'm sure yours is too. I don't think that I'm very different than most people. Except for maybe my ability just to remember useless things. That is way beyond most people's ability. But, having said that, I'm telling you the truth. We need to be childlike in our faith. But that's very different, very different than childish in your faith. Right? You need to be childlike. Humble, pliable, teachable, not childish. 
How many of you have seen a ridiculous fit by a child? No, wait. How many of you have pitched a ridiculous fit as a child? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> My children just went. Yeah. How many of you have pitched a ridiculous fit as an adult? I'm going to tell you a story. And, and it's not a story that I'm proud of, but it's a story that you need to hear. Sarah made me mad one day. If you could imagine that. And I went into our bathroom, and I was standing there facing the wall, and I said, Dad, go on it. And I went like that. I stuck both my hands through the wall. <laughs> I'm not kidding, right behind the toilet. <laughs> Broke the sheetrock all to pieces. You know what I had to do? I then had to go to Lowe's. I had to go to Lowe's and buy the things I needed to patch the holes that I just punched in the wall. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a mature man. That is childish and ridiculous. Every one of you are laughing because I'll bet you have a story something like that. You probably didn't punch holes in the wall. But maybe you did. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's childish. That's not mature actions. But instead, act mature. Begin to try to see what a mature Christian would do and seek from mature Christians that knowledge and application. Those of you that are mature Christians, help a brother out. Even more so, the small children. Right? We have this idea that you come to Jesus and then you're good. That's true. Perfectly true. 100% true. Agree with it. But we have a job as Christians to help one another out. To give knowledge that we've gained, give wisdom that we've gained over the years. And the truth is, there are some Christians that have been a Christian for a year or two that have become more mature than some of you who have been Christians for 20 years. What's the difference? It's who they're learning from. Where they're seeking their information. And feeding on the word of God. That's it. It's who they're seeking their information from. Here's a great thing that you need to remember. We are taken care of by our daddy. And he takes good care of us. So you don't have to worry about being taken care of. Seek him. Grow in maturity and teach those around you how to do it too. That's called discipleship. And it's where the church has dropped the ball from the very beginning. Right? We're really good at initially telling people about Jesus and we're really bad about helping them become mature Christians. Because most of the time, most of us don't know how to be mature, mature Christians. And so we don't know what to teach them or how to do it. And those of us that are, keep it to ourselves. And sometimes become religious and get farther and farther away from God. Satan will never stop trying to win you. But here's good news. You're in the hand of God and nothing can break his grip. He is a good father and he will never let you go. He loves you too much to do that. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die so that you wouldn't have to. What kind of love is that? What kind of love is that that would take your baby and sacrifice it for somebody that says, I hate you? Because that's what God really, truly did. I did not 
even come close to being able to understand that until I had babies. But none of you are going to get a sacrifice of one of my babies to save you. But my God did that. We need to spend time helping each other grow in maturity. Because if we become mature and grow in Christ, what's going to happen to us is we're going to become more humble, more teachable, more pliable. We're going to become childlike in our faith. We're going to have more joy. We're going to be more excited. We're going to be closer to God. Isn't that what you want? We need to disciple one another. We were just talking before the service started, and, and uh, there's a great class getting ready to come up. I'm pretty sure it's going to kick off sometime soon, and we're going to go through the book of Romans. I'm going to go ahead and just canonize it. Fine. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a small group and go through the book of Romans. The reason that we're doing that is because Romans is awesome at discipling. As a matter of fact, many of the people that I read, Martin Luther, there's a whole bunch of names that are big like that, that came to the truth to the book of Romans. They just started reading Romans. And, and all of a sudden became amazed and, and understood what it was to be a Christian, how the nuts and bolts work together, and, and how to apply it in their lives. It's a great book. And so we're going to we're gonna begin to do that. So if you're interested in growing in your faith, having revelations about God and his love for you, about sin and its awfulness, about life and what it means to live truly, then come to this Bible study. It will be worth it. I, I'm talking, I've been talking to him about trying to start a, 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 a new members class kind of thing where we teach the basic doctrines of Christianity. I, I think that's something that we desperately need because you guys may know everything that's in the class. But it wouldn't help to rehash it all. Right? And some of the times, you assume you know a whole lot of things and you're really confused. It was really helpful for me when I went to seminary for somebody who knew how it worked to tell me how it worked and put it together for me. I'm going to save you the money. I'm going to save you the money, guys. I'll give it to you for free. I want you guys to understand your faith as fully as you can so that when you become mature Christians, there won't be holes and chinks in your armor. You won't be confused by questions that people ask you. You won't feel like you're inadequate. You ever notice that little babies rarely feel inadequate? Even though they're completely inadequate? I mean, what can they do? Cry, drink, milk, use the bathroom on themselves. Right? Somebody's got to come along and fix all those things. Otherwise, they're going to die. And yet, they are perfectly okay with who they are. At least what they know of themselves at the time. But as we become adults, we become much less childlike in that. We're very sure of who we are. Are you? <coughs> I would say that being completely sure of who you are is a fine thing if it's grounded in God. But being completely sure of who you are because you made yourself is childish. And it's right up there with punching holes behind your toilet in the wall. We need to try as hard as we can to make sure that everyone in this church knows Jesus. And I don't care the age. Here's a quote from my favorite theologian. It says, Before a child reaches seven, teach him all the way to heaven. And better still, the work will thrive. 
If he learns before he's five. That was by Spurgeon. It's an amazing quote. We don't think like that, do we? I had people telling me that my kids could not have accepted Christ at their age. There are Christians who are good people. They're going to be in heaven with us, and they're really confused about who Christ offers the gospel to. He made the message so simple that it doesn't matter your brain capacity, your age, your weight, anything. It doesn't matter. It's so simple that you can understand it. He didn't make it complicated. We need to teach the truth of the gospel to our children. I have some tools that, that I used myself. Um, one of them was the Westminster Catechism. And I know that we don't have a, a catechism. We don't use that word in the church. But I found it and I read through it and I liked it because it, it asked questions and then you taught the answers to the kids. And so on the way to school every morning, we would, I would ask the question and then they would answer. And then I would ask the next question and they would answer. And eventually we worked our way all the way through it. You can use whatever you want. You can use Romans Road if you want. You can just read the book of Romans to them. Just anything you can to get the word into their ears. And do it before they can read. Spend time talking to them like they're adults about God. Tell them the gospel flat out. You can even do it in a baby voice if you want. Teach them the word. And do it humbly and lovingly. Because they have to know the truth. Jesus is sitting down in the middle of a pile of kids. Guys, they're probably crawling on him and pulling his hair and grabbing his beard and pulling on his tunic. Or, I mean, use your imagination. You know what kids do. Probably one of them smelling his feet. He's sitting right there in the middle of them. And here's something that's really interesting. Cranky old people scare children. I'm sorry, but they do. Sometimes cranky old people scare me. They scare children. Jesus was not a cranky old person. You know, it's really interesting. This is, this is true. Um, we did this thing when I was a senior in high school called Senior Prophecies. You know, this guy will be a wrestler and this guy will be this and that. You know what my senior prophecy was? He will grow up to be a grumpy old man. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah, I still have the little thing that it was published in. Guys, praise be to God, that's not who I am. Most of the time. Don't be cranky religious people. We don't need that. We have plenty of those all over the world. Instead, be childlike, loving children. Where's the slide where Mason was reaching out? Uh, there we go. Yeah. No, nope, it's gone. I got it, I got it. All right. This is an interesting picture. So here's what happened, right? Mason found a ginormous mud puddle, stripped his shirt off, and started flopping in it, and rolling and rubbing mud all over him. And then he came up to me and was like, hey, hold me. Right? What did I do? What does a good father do to a muddy child? Hose him off. <laughs> Actually, no. I just jerked him up and gave him a big old hug and ruined the clothes that I had on. Because I wasn't about to pass that up. You know, he hasn't ever done that since, and I'm perfectly okay with it. 
But I have that memory forever of a father looking at a dirty child saying, hold me. That's who we are as Christians. Dirty, nasty, stanky children. Right? Holding our hands up saying, hold me, Dad. That's who we are. That's a mature Christian. Do you realize that? One who realizes that they can't do it is the beginning of maturity, guys. And even if you're 116 years old, you're still in that same posture. That's one of the reasons that some people raise their hands when they're singing, is to mimic that idea of, we need you. You don't have to do it, but it is a good example of, of, of who we are and where we are. I like to think that most pastors, when they're doing things like this, are, are doing that, but I'm not entirely sure that's always true. I know, without a doubt, that God is doing something amazing here. That God is moving in a mighty way. And Jesus is trying to remind us that he loves his babies. And that we need to love his babies. And we are all his babies. Let the children come to me so that I might bless them. Let the children come so that I might bless them. Let this quote resonate in your mind this week. Let this marinate around in your head. Be intentional about being a mature believer in God and growing in your faith this week and sharing it with somebody. And if you have children, make sure that you are teaching them the truth. Make sure that you are spending time with them in the Word. If you want some good resources to do that, like I said, Sarah and I have some pretty good ones. But you need to know that it's your job to spend time teaching the Word of God to those who are less mature or even those who are more mature. Right? I mean, we have people teaching classes here, and I never ask, well, where are you on the maturity scale? Uh, you know. No, if, if, you're, if you know Jesus and you're willing to serve, we will allow you to figure it out and give you the tools you need to be successful at it. If that's not happening, I messed something up. That's on me. I want you to feel free to serve Christ in the church. I want you to feel like the children feel about most things. Excited. I feel as though on occasion I'm the only one in this room that's actually excited about anything. But if I was sitting where you were, I probably wouldn't be as excited. I mean, I understand. That's why I tell you it's okay if you need to stand up, walk around, if you need to randomly yell, it's, it's fine. I, I don't care. It won't stop me from doing what I'm doing. Most of the thing, the only thing that stops me from doing what I'm doing is the stupid technology not working. And that's just because I'm trying to think about how to fix it because that's kind of, I, I like puzzles. Right? That's just how my mind works. But guys, listen. We need to be all about teaching the gospel. All about discipleship and all about childlike faith. Love one another. Because Christ first loved you.